Hi, this is Dr. Gordo, and welcome to the Raven the Writing Desk. This video is a collection of all of our videos on the parts of speech in the order of verbs, nouns, pronouns, then alphabetically adverbs, adjectives, articles, conjunctions, and prepositions. At the end, I added in the video on clauses because in order to understand how English is put together, it is important to understand what a clause is and how it functions since we're talking about all the lexicon anyways. And so I hope you enjoy this video and I look forward to seeing your questions and comments. Of course, if you'd like to see these videos individually, they are all available individually. I thank you for your time. And arguably, verbs are the most important parts of speech. They are the backbone of language. They are action words. If you can master the verbs of a foreign language, without knowing any other words. I mean, obviously this is an oversimplification, but you could do well to be understood if you only know verbs. And that certainly applies to English as well. So if you're an English language learner, learn your verbs. And if you're watching this channel because you want to become a better writer, knowing how to use verbs to the, the best of their ability, and of course, widening your vocabulary is going to make you a better writer. So, let's get into this. So, actions can be material or immaterial. I walk. I think. One can be demonstrated just by seeing it, and then the other one, when you're dealing with things that are non-matter, such as thinking and thoughts, again, it's a concept that is understood. The good news is whether the verb is material or immaterial does not impact its spelling or the way you pronounce it. Now, on a side note, I should say in English, we form the infinitive by adding to in front of the verb. In other languages that I'm familiar with, the infinitive is a word in itself. It's the verb in its simplest form, meaning in order to action. In English, technically the infinitive is actually one word. Even though to is a word, walk is a word, to walk is considered a word. The kicker though, is the infinitive is actually acting like a noun. So I'm going to get into the infinitive a little later in the conversation. The reason why I mention it here is quite often when you see a verb in English, they'll demonstrate it as the infinitive for reasons we don't really need to get into. But to walk, it's all about the action of walking. To think is all about the action of thinking. Verbs will team up with a noun or pronoun to form a subject. For example, Jesus wept. I use that example because it came to mind. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Jesus is the noun. Wept, to, to cry, is the verb. So noun plus verb, you've got a subject. And in this case here, you've got an independent clause. You have a complete thought. Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Now, I think a good place to begin is to, to talk about the 12 different verb tenses in English. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually divided into a chart of whether the action is taking place in the present the past, or the future. And not to get too philosophical, but that it's always the state of things. That it's always today. It's always the present. It's never yesterday. And it's never tomorrow. We talk about the past in the future in philosophical terms. Again, not to get too deep into it, but to be aware of this fact, to be aware of these concepts, is to set yourself up for success when it comes to using verb properly. Is the action taking place now? Has the action already taken place? 
or is it going to take place in the future? In addition, is the action completed, ongoing, or yet to start? With all of this in mind, let's get into the 12 verb tenses, and I'm using the example to walk. First up, we have the simple tense, and it's called simple because it's straightforward. So in the present tense, and I'm using uh, the first person pronoun I, I walk, past, I walked, future, I will walk. So as we can see here, for the present tense, we take the infinitive and we just simply put our pronoun in front. In this case, I'm referring to myself. It's I, I walk. To form the past tense, I just add ed to walk to form walked. And I got the past tense. I walked. Whether it was yesterday or last year, it doesn't matter. I walked. Now, when I'm done this presentation, I'm, I'm going to be going for a walk. And so I will walk when I'm done with this recording. In passing, I just want you to be aware, if you're not aware already, that English, like many languages, full of irregular verbs. They do not follow a consistent form of spelling. The bad news is you simply have to learn them. You just need to practice your English, practice your writing as you learn all the different verb all the different irregular verbs. So one irregular one here, it's to write. So I write, and in the future, I will write, easy enough, but the past tense is I wrote instead of I write it. It's I wrote. This is also an example of a strong verb. Don't need to get too much uh, into that detail, but whenever you see the verb, the past tense verb with an O in there, it's going to be a strong verb. Good to know if you're a writer. And really, all you need to worry about here is uh, spelling and consistency. Because I got to tell you, if, I, if I'm talking to someone and they were to say, so uh, I, I write a note for my teacher, it's completely incorrect but I still understand the person because they're being consistent with their pronoun, all the information. They've just simply said it, write it instead of wrote. So there's the good news here. Be consistent, take an educated guess, and if you're wrong, you're wrong. You learn something. And in the meantime, just be positive and focus on learning your irregular verbs, however it is that you learn. Do you write it down? Do you give yourself some flashcards? You think about how you're going to keep track of all these irregular verbs. And let's move on to the next slide. So I can do a quick note on pronunciation. I've learned this from being an English language teacher, is when learners see that ed at the end of the word and uh, without getting too much detail syllables have a vowel sound in it the the learner wants to stress that ed so instead of saying i walked they say i walked it i walked it to the store and so you got to point out to people that okay it's a light touch it's more of a t than anything i walked to the store. Unfortunately, I can't do a universal on this because if the preceding syllable ends in a, a D or a T sound, like to divide, okay, I've already done it, I've divided. The leaning tower of Pisa, it tilts. It's a tilted tower. In those cases, we're doing the extra stress on the ED simply because we already had a D sound in there, so we, didn't, we need to make sure that it's heard. Otherwise, just lightly touch that ED. T walk, walked. Moving on to the next verb form, 
let's take a look at what's called the progressive. The progressor, the progressive focuses on an occurring action. I am walking. So I'm in the state of walking right now. Yesterday, uh, something happened when I was walking. And in the future, again, I will be walking once I'm done this recording. And so you can probably see already we're taking the, uh, the, in, the infinitive. We're conjugating it into whatever it needs to do to match the pronoun. So I walked, he walks, uh, so forth. We conjugate the verb to be first. So I am, I was, I will be. Then we add in the verb, and then we add ing to the verb form. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any crazy spellings you should be oh, need to be aware of. So you're adding ing to the verb, and then putting the conjugated form of I am in front of it to form the progressive. I am walking, I was walking, I will be walking. Now we're getting into a little trickier of a text, of a uh, of a tense, sorry. It's odd name, it's called the perfect. In grammar, perfect means completed. And for those who know English, you're probably thinking, okay, so if I got, wrote a test and the teacher said, ah, oh, the test is perfect. In a sense, they're saying the test is complete. There's no further information that needs to be added to make this test any better. It's perfect the way it is. It's complete. We form the perfect in English to describe a completed action. And we do this because we really want the audience to focus on that completed action. I have walked. I had walked. I will have walked. There's some other information going on here that I want the audience to focus on the fact that I completed this task of walking. Because even in the present tense, it's like, I have walked these streets for years and wow, the houses are starting to look sad. We form the perfect by taking the infinitive to have, conjugating it to match the pronoun, and then we take the verb and we add ed to the end. So this is tricky because even in the present tense, we're talking about a completed task, something that was just completed. And there's something about that completed action that we want to draw the audience's attention to. It's something that as you use more in your everyday speech, it begins to make more sense. In the meantime, let's move on to our final verb tense. And you can maybe see it coming. It's the perfect progressive. The focus is on the result of an occurring action. So we're really getting conceptual here. We're going to take the verb to have and conjugate it. We're going to add in the verb Ben, then we're going to add in our infinitive, then we're going to add ing uh, to that conjugated infinitive. The result being, I have been walking, I had been walking, I will have been walking. So for that last example, by six o'clock tonight, I will have been walking two hours. I had been walking for days. I have been walking these streets for a while now. Uh, and again, you're setting up another idea here. We're just looking at the actual function of the different verb tenses. So to quickly recap, look at the action. When is the action happening? Present, past, future. Is the action still occurring? Or has the action completed? And what is the focus of the sentence? Do you wish to draw the, the reader or the audience's attention 
to the person in that sentence? Do you wish to draw attention to the actual action? This is what the the linguist Michel Thomas, he does wonderful tapes on learning the Romance languages. He talks about a heightened sense, a heightened awareness of language. What exactly is it that you're trying to communicate? That is when you're choosing the finer words. Now, for someone who's tr listening to these videos because you want to become a better writer, this is something you're going to think a lot about, you're going to reflect a lot. If you're an English language learner, you're going to trip yourself up overthinking exactly what it is that you're trying to say. That is where you need to be less afraid to make mistakes and just take your educated guess. Just blurt it out. And again, if it's wrong, well, then you learn from it. And if it's correct, congratulations, you're learning. The main takeaway is if the subject is clear, the idea is probably going to be understood. And if you're an English language learner, just use simple words. Just use the simple verb tense until you become more comfortable with the progressive or the perfect. And you can also use other words in your sentence as road signs uh, for the audience to help them understand what it is that you're talking about. So, for example, this isn't great English, but if I was to say, I go now to the store, what is that I'm communicating? I'm clearly indicating that I'm going to the store right now. If I was to say, I go tomorrow to the store, again, it doesn't sound that great in English, but the idea is clearly understood. Tomorrow, I'm going to go to the store. And if I was to say, uh, yesterday, I go to the store and Again, not great English. It should be, I went to the store. But by saying, yesterday I go, I'm setting myself up for success. I'm giving the road signs to the audience of where I'm going with my ideas. So, don't overthink it. Just do it. So, let's do it then. How are we going to use verbs? Verbs cover all states of being. I, I went over this when I was talking about material and immaterial. Sometimes verbs are going to be dynamic. Something is happening. Again, you're, you're talking about action that is occurring. Something is happening. It looks like it's changing. We also use verbs to talk about static states of being. Uh, one thing I, I hear quite a bit on some of the channels that I'm on Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Miles Morales is Miles Morales. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. He's always going to be Spider-Man. As opposed to Miles Morales. Miles Morales, he's awesome. He's a great Miles Morales. He's always going to be Miles Morales. And in both cases here, whether we were talking about a dynamic action or a static or fixed action, we're using the exact same verb in the exact same form. We're pronouncing it the same way. So, again, I'd like to emphasize the good news that sometimes when English is consistent, boy, does it just make sense. You're going to be using verbs a lot as what are called auxiliary or helping verbs. Quite often, we're going to see it with the verb to be. Again, is is a great example of a conjugated form of to be, to have, and to do. These are all important linking verbs because, wow, we use them a lot in English. And once you actually become aware that to be, to have, to do, between all 12 tenses, there's 36 words right there. And we use them a lot to describe our everyday activity. So, honest, good advice to you. If you do not know it already, know to be, to have, to do in all 12 tenses. And if you're an English language learner, you'll have a lot of choice in expressing ideas. Now, that said about English language learners, uh, they get quite tripped up with the concept in English of to have. Because in English, 
the same words can have multiple meanings. And to have can mean to possess, to own something, but it can also be to consume. So I'm going to have dinner. Oh, what did you drink? Oh, uh, I had a Coca-Cola. Uh, I just had some water. So we have a curious expression in English. To have his cake and eat it too. People are like, well, if you're having cake. Well, if you're having cake, aren't you eating it? Isn't that like a, an oxymoron? No, no, no. He's talking about one cannot possess a cake and eat it. Either you have this big, beautiful cake to look at, or you eat it. You can't have both. Likewise, in English, wow, do we use to do a lot. To do means to make something. It could mean to work on something. It could also mean to complete an action. I will do it later. I did it already. Do you want to go? I'm doing it tomorrow. All of these different ideas are being expressed, even though they're all using the same verb. So again, learning to do better be on your to do list. And once you're done that, here are all the auxiliaries. Be, can, could, dare, do, have, may, might, must, need, ought, shall, should, will, and would. Let's talk a little bit more about these auxiliaries. In regards to modality, again, English teacher term, you don't need to know. It's talking about could, should, must, as well as the adverbs possibly or necessarily. How urgent is the action? And is there an option whether we need to do that action or not? So, may I go to the washroom? Is what you should say if you're asking for permission to go to the washroom. So quite often with students, they'll say, oh, may I go to the washroom? Or more likely, students are going to ask, can I go to the washroom? Which creates the old English joke, I don't know, can you? Because can talks about ability. If you're asking me, can I go to the washroom? Well, I don't know, can you? Because technically you're asking me ability. I will say this, in everyday speech, there's no difference between may and can. People use them interchangeably. So if a, if a student asks me, can I go to the washroom? I'm not going to make that joke about, oh, I don't know, can you? I'm going to say, yeah, sure. Maybe they need to sign out, something like that. What's more interesting are words like must, shall, and should. If you must do something, that means there's no other action. Hey, I must go to the washroom right now. As in, I don't care if you say no, I'm leaving. I'm going. I have to do this. You'll also see the term shall, particularly in legal paperwork. Shall is the fancy way of saying must. If someone says you shall surrender your driver's license, that means you just lost your driver's license. You have no option here. As opposed to the word should, it suggests an obligation that is at least somewhat voluntary. It's like, well, I should go to bed right now. It's getting late. Well, yeah, if it's getting late, you probably should go. But I have the option of staying up later. So for modality, knowing the difference between may, can, must, shall, should, when they're teaming up with verbs, gives you that extra dimension of meaning. Let's continue. Phrasal verbs. A phrasal verb is when we have a verb and then we team it up with an adverb or a preposition to form a new word. If you're not familiar with prepositions, watch our video on it. Uh, a preposition is the position of something. So the pen is on the desk. There's a garbage can underneath the desk. There is a chair beside the desk and, and so forth. Where is one object in position to another? We do this a lot in English. The one example I have here is if you take the word to work. To, to work means 
uh, to do your job, or to solve something. If we add in the preposition out and form the new phrase to work out, that usually means exercise. I'm going to the gym to work out. When I was uh, living in Sweden, I noticed a lot of people said train. Yeah, I'm going to the gym to train. But in at least here in Canada, we say I'm going to work out at the gym. To work out can also mean to solve something. So the students worked out a problem. Forming these phrasal verbs is more of a matter of just learning them. Even if you were to look up a list of English phrasal verbs and memorize them, not necessarily a bad idea. Or if you're a teacher, it's a good, a good idea to form some lessons on those because we do use phrasal verbs a lot in English. When it comes to setting them up, you know, matching them up with your pronoun, just use your tense rules. The preposition itself never changes. For example, I had been working out when something happened. The students are going to be solving the problem. Oh, sorry, I meant to say the students are going to work out, are going to be working out the problem, are going to work out the problem, sorry. Uh, that's the fault of my slide there. And that's all I'm going to say about phrasal verbs. I could create a whole video on them alone, so if you're interested in more about this, just let me know down in the comments. That's a video I could throw together. Otherwise, I'd like to start to wrap up this video. English teachers in the audience, you're going to want to know the difference between transitive, intransitive, and detransitive verbs. They are all just fancy titles for what is the verb doing with an object or to an object in the sentence. This is good for English language learners to show how stable an English sentence can be. So I put together the sentence, Thornton passed the puck to the goalie. If you do not know hockey, that may have sounded like gibberish to you. But the good news is, in English, look at how we're going to set up the noun and the verb to form a subject. So Thornton passed. I could say, I could just make up words right now like, uh, uh, Degimity, dist. Like, what the heck does that mean? You know it means something because the noun is followed by a verb and you're recognizing it as a verb because it's ending in ed. I've seen this done before that people can just make up gibberish words, but as long as there's certain things that are consistent, like the past tense of the verb ending in ed, people are going to be able to take an educated guess at what is going on. So back to this sentence, Thornton passed the puck to the goalie. In this case here, the puck is the direct object because Thornton, who is the subject, is doing something with it. And what's he doing with it? He's sending it off to another object in the sentence, which makes it the indirect object. In this case, the goalie is the indirect object. So a direct object is the noun or pronoun receiving the action. And if the noun or pronoun is receiving the object from the direct object, that's an indirect object. Again, I don't like these explanations that much because they sound more complicated than they need to be. There's only a few people listening to this who actually want to know the ins and outs of the, the technical terms. But when we're talking about this, it is good to use the terms so that you can take ownership of something when you know it. Getting back to transitant, intransitant, and transitant verbs. If a verb is intransitant, Transitive, sorry. That means no object is needed for meaning to be understood. So in the sentence, Thornton passed, it's actually a sad sentence because in English, if somebody dies, uh, a euphemism is we say that they've passed. Thornton passed. Thornton died. There's no object needed because the thought is complete. 
But in this case here, we're not talking about someone dying. We're talking about playing hockey here. So we need a transitive verb in here. We need a direct object. Thornton pass the puck. Complete idea. We have a subject, and that subject is doing something with a direct object. A detransitive verb is one that can take on a direct object or an indirect object. So in this case here, you know, to the goalie, that makes the past become a detransitive verb. And again, you do not need to know these labels unless you're an English teacher. But if you're an English language learner, take heart in the idea that, wow, noun, verb, direct object, I got a complete idea. If you're matching your nouns up with a verb and you're being consistent with it, you're going to be understood as you build your knowledge of the English language and you build your confidence. Finally, I'm going to go over this quickly, linking verbs. We talk about linking verbs a lot in these videos because they're vital to complete ideas, particularly when we're talking about dependent clauses and more information is needed for the thought to make sense. So he is a YouTuber. In this case, is is acting as a linking verb, connecting the pronoun he to well, what is he? What does he do? Oh, he's a YouTuber. Also be familiar with the verb to become. He is becoming a YouTuber is different, slightly different than he is a YouTuber. So linking verbs are simply used to use a verb to attach more information onto an existing idea or to set up a new idea. It's one of those things that we use them all the time. And in fact, to give them the label makes them a little more complicated than they need to be. So the good news is just use verbs the way they've been explained in this video and you're probably going to oh, be successful with no idea of what the names of the different labels are. If you know how to use them and your goal is to know how to use them, congratulations. And if you're an English teacher and you're just gathering information for a lesson, well, then watch the video again, watch it a couple times and uh, please, you know, ask me any questions and I'll get back to you. So one last idea before we wrap up and it has to do with something called geruns. This is when we get into using nouns, verbs as nouns. I mentioned that earlier that infinitives are actually nouns. Geruns, you add ing to the verb itself. And the focus of the word becomes the, the verb as an event. We try to avoid fighting. In this case here, fighting is not a verb. It's a noun. We're trying to avoid this person, place, or thing. And that thing is fighting. So notice that the gerund doesn't have a noun or a pronoun with it to make sense because it's a noun in itself. Again, just something I wanted to squeeze in here at the end of the presentation. To recap, verbs are the most important part of language. So be familiar with it. English has 12 verb tenses. Be familiar with them. Simple, perfect, progressive, perfect, progressive. Know how to use to be, to have, and to do. Along with their modality. That's what you should, must, may, can. You'll be able to communicate a lot of complex ideas. And a lot of simple ideas at that. So note how verbs interact with direct and indirect objects in sentences to form ideas. And finally, verbs can be nouns, geruns, or infinitives. And I see I spelled infinitives wrong there. Nouns galore. What is a noun? I'm glad you asked. It's a person, place, or thing. And this thing can be matter or non-matter. It'll make more sense when we get into the details. A noun in a sentence or a pronoun will form the subject, so they are important to spot and just say 
side note on nouns, if you're not sure, well, is that word acting as a noun or not? One way to test it out is, can you put the definite article, the, in front of it? If you can say the article, then, you know, you've got a noun. So let's go a little more detail. So a few sentences here to illustrate the nouns. The park is beautiful. Park is a noun. Taylor Swift's concert, sell it instantly. A person's name is a noun. We care about the comfort of our patients. So here's an example of something that is in the non-matter category. I mean, we can think of physical ways we can be comfortable, but comfort as a concept is non-matter. The Atlantic Ocean is one of our five oceans. So Atlantic Ocean is a noun. Oceans, also noun. And I'm creating this video on an iPad. So as we can see, there's nouns in every complete sentence. Because once again, you need to have a noun or a pronoun for a subject. Diving into the topic, nouns are divided between common and proper nouns. Proper nouns are the formal names for people or places and are spelt with an uppercase letter or a big letter, if you will, such as countries, Canada, stadiums, Rogers Center that's in Toronto, people's name, John Smith, we saw Taylor Smith mentioned uh, Taylor Swift, sorry, mentioned earlier on, and Instagram, just the title of anything. That's why I've got the sentence here, are you going to get an iPhone or a Galaxy? So notice with iPhone, because of its branding, it's purposely spelt with a small i followed by an uppercase P. Again, that's branding, and because of the popularity of the iPhone, we've gotten really used to it, as opposed to an Android phone such as a Galaxy but we're going to spell it with a capital letter, regardless of where they appear in a sentence. And of course, if you're uh, speaking to somebody, we don't <laughs> know what letters are capitalized when we're speaking. It's only in the written text that we see it. So common nouns, all nouns that are not proper. The everyday people, place, and things that we uh, encounter and they are not capitalized unless, of course, the word begins the sentence. So I've got an example here. John is tall. He is a fireman. In a few years, he might be the chief. So what I've done here is, well, first of all, John, it's somebody's name. You spell it with a capital letter. Now, he is a fireman. Should a fireman be spelt with a capital F because it's the name of a job? Generally speaking, titles are capitalized, such as being the chief of the fire department. That's why I've spelt it with a capital C. And I've left fireman with the lowercase f because generally speaking, that's what you do. Just types of jobs are common nouns. Actual titles are proper nouns. So once again, when you're speaking, you don't have to worry about any of this. It's only when we're writing things down and we get into capitalization. If you were to spell fireman with an uppercase F, your teacher, whoever's reading it, probably not going to say anything. And even if you spell chief with a smaller or with a lowercase C, chances are no one's going to say anything unless you want to be really strict with uh, how things are properly done, or if you're an English teacher and you want things to be exact. I do want to do a side note about the personal pronoun I. I is always a capital letter in English. It is never spelt with a lowercase I. And again, we're not talking about words that begin with I, like island. We're talking about the personal pronoun I. I don't fluently speak any other languages, but languages I am familiar with, when you're referring to yourself, the words you use, chances are it is spelt with a lowercase letter if it's the middle of the sentence. I'm thinking a je in French or yo in Spanish. 
In English, though, it's always a capital I, such as on Monday, I went to the new dog park. And I guess I'm so adamant about this because I've taught in numerous other countries. And when I've been working with students learning English, they tend to put I, the lowercase in the middle of a sentence. And then I got to point it out. I've noticed with my Canadian students in recent years are doing the same thing. Is it because uh, it's not being corrected on text messaging? I'm not really sure. Again, I just want to be adamant. Make sure it is a capital I when you're referring to yourself. Enough said. Singular and plural. If there is more than one person, place, or thing, you need to pluralize it. Very easy in English. You're just going to add the letter S and add a little S to the end of the word. So picture, pictures, park, parks. Now, what if the word already ends in that s sound, such as glass or tax? We are going to add es to pluralize it, just so that we can hear that secondary s, glass, glasses, tax, taxes. This is getting really technical now. And again, unless you're an English teacher, this isn't really going to interest you. But we have further labels for nouns, such as concrete nouns. A concrete noun is something that we can pick up with one of our five senses. So taste, smell, sight, etc. I dropped my phone in my coffee. The phone is something physical. It's something that can be touched. And a coffee, obviously, is something that can be smelled, something that can be seen, and so forth. Abstract is when we're getting into non-matter, again, getting back to the concept of comfort. It's You can't look at something and say, that is comfort. It may look comfortable, but that's a little bit different, isn't it? Abstract is something that is an idea. It's a concept. So if I was to say, that kid has grit, I mean, the, the kid has a lot of guts, the, the kid has a lot of determination, she doesn't let anything get her down. So in this case, grit is an abstract noun. Then we also have collective nouns, which are a little bit easier to explain when we get into non-count and count nouns. This is probably the trickiest part of this lesson, and that is quite often in English, we have individuals coming together to form something that is single, something that is collective. For example, if I have numerous students and I want those students to work together, I'll put them in a group. So even though that group is made up of multiple students, we still treat it as singular. The group works well together, as opposed to the group work well together. Group in this sense, is a collective noun. It is quite similar to the idea of non-count nouns. Let's take a look at those now. So, because we need to know whether the noun is singular or plural, so we can have the correct verb form and all the other subject agreement stuff, what if the object can't reasonably be counted? for whatever reason. I put together this sentence. In Canada, we call a coffee with two small containers of milk and two packets of sugar as a double-double. I had to really think about what do you call those little packets of milk that they have at the, the restaurant? You could call it a small container. I've heard juglets. I've heard packets or just simply creamer, or just simply milk. And when it comes to sugar, when you've got the packets, there's one packet, okay, there's two packets of sugar, that's easy enough to count, but the milk and the sugar itself, sure, you can measure it and put grams on it or milliliters, but that isn't exactly convenient to do when you're having a conversation. So the deal with count and non-count nouns is, 
if the object can be reasonably counted, such as here are two pairs of shoes. One, two, three, four. Okay, yeah, yeah, you got a, two pairs of shoes there. But let's just say I'm having some food and I have some French fries, which can be counted, and I'd like some ketchup for that. Can I please have some ketchup for my French fries? I'm not going to say, can I have X number of milliliters of ketchup? Because why? It's, it's just too complicated. It's just so much easier to treat it as a non-count noun. So a non-count noun is an object that we just sort of take as a whole. Going back to the whole example of uh, milk and sugar... If I was at a, a restaurant and I, I want some milk, they're probably going to bring out an actual container of milk to put into my coffee. Where if I, I ask for two milks, they're probably going to physically give me the container. I'm also thinking about know, someone's house and someone says, would you like a water? And I say, sure. I assume they're going to hand me a bottle of water. But if they ask me, would you like some water? They're probably going to pour me a glass. Again, count nouns versus non-count nouns. To help us out with non-count nouns, you've heard me saying the word some. That is known as a determiner. While we're not concerned about the exact amount of water or milk or ketchup or sugar, we do like to add in a little bit of a, a qualifying word to be a little bit more precise. So let's have some fun. How much fun are we going to have? I don't know. Some. Does anyone here have any ideas? Maybe one person has one idea. Maybe someone has two. Any ideas? And we could say the house is full of happiness. Because I mean, how, how do you measure happiness? Here you can see the mixing of concrete abstract and collective nouns when we come to count and non-count nouns. It is really straightforward. Can it be reasonably counted? Yes or no. If the answer is yes, it's a count noun. If the answer is no, it's a non-count noun. And these, this is important to know because again, we want to make sure that you've got noun verb agreement. You want to make sure that uh, you're setting the sentence up for success. There are whole other videos on this. In particular, check out rule number nine on noun verb agreement and rule number one about forming the possessive. An earlier example about Taylor Swift's concerts, that's an example of a possessive, how a noun can essentially own something else. But again, check out the video on rule number one. And we'll start to wrap this up. Nouns can be modified by an adjective, but nouns can also modify other nouns in a system called an attribute noun. We've already seen a couple of them. Common noun, proper noun, rice pudding, utility jeep, dollar store. And you might think, well, isn't that noun just acting as an adjective? Sure. Uh, again, this is that area where if you're an English teacher, you'll be quite keen on making sure that you know your terms, you know how you're explaining it properly. But if you're just someone trying to become a better writer or just learning the language, don't worry too much about this. It's just nouns are just people, place, and things. Every sentence is going to have one, if not a pronoun. And so just go with that. And just... Uh, finally, there's something similar called an appositive noun, where a noun provides more information for another noun, but uh, I can just wrap that up in another video again. Don't worry too much about this. Don't worry too much about it, because nouns are easy. To form the plural, you're just adding S or possibly ES. Just You're looking at an object, and you're giving it a name, other concepts are also considered as nouns that are not something you can point to, but now I feel I'm in that area where you're trying to explain something that's relatively simple, and in doing so, you're making it more complicated than it needs to be. So 
This is where your time and effort is going to pay off. Learn the English words for different objects. Learn how to spell them. And then the rest will just come naturally because you're going to develop an ear for the language. You're going to learn about what sounds best. Have pronouns galore. So we're going to talk about pronouns, what they are, how do you use them, and particularly how you use them both in formal and informal settings. So very quickly, what's a pronoun? A pronoun replaces a noun. A noun is a person, place, or thing. If you'd like to know more about nouns, go check out our video on the subject. The idea of pronouns is to replace nouns to make speech writing text smoother. For example, Gord likes making videos. Gord makes videos every day. As opposed to Gord likes making videos, he makes them every day. Repeating the same nouns over and over makes it sound like a children's book because it's a less sophisticated form of speech. Pronouns give us the ability to smooth things out by using different words. And that's one thing I advise writers to try is that using different words, generally speaking, sounds better than using the same words over and over again, unless the repetition is being done on purpose. But we can get into that in another video. Before I continue, I feel the need to do a disclaimer about how here we are focused on the factual functioning of language at the Raven and the Writing Desk. When I provide commentary over why one word group works better than a different word group or explaining the, the ins and outs of the language, I'm trying to be as factual as possible. The reason why I'm making this disclaimer is there's a lot of controversy around pronouns at the moment. I don't want to get into this controversy or really even talk about it at length. I just want to say that I'm aware of it. And in this presentation, we're just trying to stick to the facts. <clears throat> in a sentence or clause, uh, an object is the something that receives the action such as the sentence, he spoke to the audience. He is the subject. The audience is the object. He's speaking. The audience hears it. So, subjects and objects help each other to balance ideas. It's important to be aware of subjects and objects in order to properly use pronouns. So, without further ado, let's get into it. In modern English, nouns do not have grammatical gender. Perhaps you speak a language where you do need to know the gender of a word because it's going to impact other words in the sentence. Luckily, in modern English, we don't have to worry about that, which is why we have such a simple set of articles. Articles, the, or a. Uh. The N is only used when the next word begins with a vowel sound, but I've got a whole other video on that. For our purposes here today, we do need to recognize that traditionally, English third-person pronouns are gendered. And so let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. I jammed a lot of information on this slide, but I'm going to read it to you. In everyday discourse... Use the subject-object possessive third-person pronouns as follows. For males, he, him, his. Jack is wearing his good coat. He looks good in it. His grandmother gave it to him. For females, she, her, hers. Sally is going to be a doctor. She is serious about her grades. The profession is hers to master. For animals, inanimate objects, or just neuter objects, it it its. The dog loves its bowl. It carries it around all day. Finally, everyone shares the plural they, them, theirs. The crowd loved them. They sang for three hours and made the stage theirs. 
Now we're going to transition into the concept of preferred pronouns. So it's not something to be too concerned about, about making a mistake, because the vast majority of English speakers, and if I had to hazard a guess, I would say 90% of English speakers use traditional pronouns, the ones I just told you about. When you see a boy's name, such as Gordon or Gord, use he, him, his. If you see a girl's name, uh, I have a sister named Natalie, she, her, hers. But what if you're unsure? And this can happen a lot because there are names that can be shared with both boys and girls. And sometimes we get into the short form of a word, such as Pat. Pat can be short for Patricia, but it could also be short for Patrick. So what do you do? One simple thing you can do is just to use the plural. We've been doing it for many, many years in English. Pat loves the movies. They go all the time. Yes, they refers to more than one, but we're not sure of the gender of Pat. So we're just going to say they, and we're going to move on. However, you may notice in emails that someone will have a traditional boy's name or a traditional girl's name, and the Basadi will see preferred pronouns, and they don't seem to match. You know, Jack, which is a derivative of John, boy's name. You might see Jack preferred pronouns, she, her, as in Jack likes her jacket. And now you may not know Jack, but Jack could be a short form for Jacqueline. It could be a female, and the female, this particular female, doesn't like people confusing the pronouns because she kind of goes by a guy's nickname, a boy's nickname, so she's asking for clarification. And there are many reasons why people would put preferred pronouns into their email that we don't need to get into here. My advice to English language learners is, when you see those preferred pronouns, use them. Now, you are not obligated to share your pronouns with the world. You can just put your name in the email and leave it at that. And I highly advise against asking someone for their preferred pronouns if unknown. This is where we get into a bit of controversy. You might be thinking, well, I want to make sure I'm polite. And if I ask someone their preferred pronouns, then I know that I won't make a mistake. However, what if that person wants to use non-traditional pronouns but are not yet ready to share them with the world? That person's just been put on the spot. After all, you've just asked a stranger a personal question. Personal pronouns are personal. So unless you're in the habit of asking strangers personal questions, don't ask someone for their pronouns. If they share them, use them. But don't ask for them. And you're under no obligation to share your own, program, your own pronouns. It's very much based on your own comfort level. And after all, when we're unsure... We can always use the plural. And speaking of which, you might see that Jack prefers the pronouns they, them. We use the same rules that we saw a moment ago. Jack says they love live music. They go to concerts alone if no one else wants to join. I bring up this example again because you might be thinking, well, if they is a plural word... What do I do with the verb? We just stick to plural. Just they, plural word, so they are. So even though we know we're referring to one person, we're going to keep the plural of the verb. That point gets really interesting when we get into third person reflexive pronouns. A reflexive situation I could simply put, that's when the subject and the object are the same thing. That's an oversimplification, but another way to look at it is when the subject's action reflects back on itself, such as, uh, John will do it himself. Sally will do it herself. Now, 
if someone has the preferred pronouns they, them. In this example, Shannon. We have a couple options. We have a relatively new word to the language, themself. I, I mentioned a moment ago that when it comes to they, them, you keep that verb plural. But this is a new development. Shannon will do it themself. So it's quite clear that we're referring to what one person, as opposed to they will do it themselves, plural. In this point here, if you were to say, Shannon will do it themselves, either because that's a preferred pronoun or you're unsure whether Shannon's a boy or a girl, because once again, that's an example that can go either way. So you've got a couple different options there to get you through. And just to wrap it up, if we're talking about a neuter object as a dog, the dog can do it itself. Let's transition now from third person, as in all those around you, to the first person. We're talking about ourselves here. So I is used when you're doing the speaking and you're the subject, you're the main idea or presenting the main idea. If you're at the receiving end of the, the action, you use me. This is one of those things where explaining it makes it sound more complicated than it needs to be. And so I'm trying to keep it as clear as possible. But obviously it's difficult because I'm saying I and you at the same time here. So hopefully these examples make sense. I'm going to the party. I am going to a party. Because... The host gave me an invitation. So if I did it, I'm going to say I. Versus if the action was done, if I'm at the receiving end, it was done to me. Sometimes this can be quite confusing. Both I and the word me can sound correct. So what do we do? It doesn't help that growing up, and I know a lot of people in the audience are going to uh, hear, feel the same way. The, your English teacher may have said, just always use I, always use I, always use I. And that can result in making mistakes. For example, John and I don't know. That is correct. To say me and John don't know, that's incorrect because John and I, we're the subject of the sentence. So we don't, we're not going to use me. And we're certainly going to say John and me don't know. As opposed to, could you please tell me and John what to do? So in this case, the you is the subject. And me and John are at the receiving end of the action. Hence, me and John. Now, what if you were to say, could you please tell John and I what to do? Only the strictest of English teachers are going to correct you. Because, again, it's such a subtle difference when it comes to everyday speech, not something you're going to need to worry about. And so I'm not going to say, oh, well, just always use I. Because, again, I don't really like that advice. When in doubt, use I. That's something to go with. Now, I can't go on without telling you one of my biggest pet peeves. And that's when people put the lowercase I when they mean the personal pronoun I, I is always spelt with a capital uppercase I. It is never written as a small I. In recent years, I've seen English language learners having a lot of trouble with it. I have a few theories on why that is. I don't need to get into here, but just please, whenever in written form you're using the word I, use a capital. Now, First person plural pronouns. Use we when you and other people are the subject and use us when you and other people are at the receiving end of the action. As in, I want a trip for the whole family. We are going to Europe. Well, what do you mean? Well, they gave us a trip to Europe. We and us are the plural forms of the first person. Now, People are going to own things, and so now we need to talk about the possessive. So, what is the possessive pronoun of the first person? For singular, it's mine, and for plural, it's ours. 
And you might be thinking, well, what about my and our? Those are actually different kinds of words. They're determiners. They're not pronouns. So, the ring is mine. No, that ring belongs to me. As opposed to, that is my ring. My is a determiner. It modifies ring. So, the ring is mine. The ranch is ours. As opposed to, welcome to our ranch. Our modifies ranch. Ours is the pro possess a pronoun. Because again, rem remember, pronouns replace nouns. They tighten the sentence so we don't have to use extra words for expressing the same idea. Now, what about first person reflexive pronouns? We just talked about reflexive pronouns in a moment. What happens when we're doing the action but we're also receiving the action. I washed myself for an hour after the game. The plural form is ourselves. We have ourselves. You know, we have nothing. Well, we have ourselves. Or you can use the reflexive pronoun ourselves for emphasis. So if I was to say we did it, that's a complete thought. There's really nothing extra you need to say. We did it. That's the whole action. We're looking at something. We're explaining that well, we're the ones who performed this act. But if we really want to stress that we did it ourselves, we would say, well, we did it ourselves as opposed we did it. It expresses the same idea, only there's an extra mm by adding in ourselves. Finally, we're getting into second person. So we just heard a lot of rules about use of the third person. It gets complicated with preferred pronouns. First person is a little more straightforward. And second person is the easiest. And that may be why we use the second person a lot in informal speech. We use it a lot for generalizations. Oh, you know when you're doing this or you know when you go on to this. Uh, we, we say you a lot when we're really talking about ourselves. And what's really interesting is English used to have different forms of the second person depending on your relationship with that person. Once again, if you're familiar with languages such as French, very sensitive to social rank and who's talking to who and as a result, the words that you should use. In English, we got rid of of all the other informal and singular words, and we were left with the formal plural word you for all instances of the second person. All you need to know is you, yours, yourself, and yourselves when it comes to the second person. This is because in English, the second person doesn't worry about subject and object. You are my favorite. That's an example of singular informal. All of you, listen to me now. Plural informal. Could you please help me? Singular formal. I am honored to speak to you today. Plural formal. And again, in the way it's written, the way it sounds, it's all the same. It's always you when it comes to the second person. When it comes to the possessive pronoun, you use yours for all the different examples. This is yours. I'm looking at something and, oh, this must be yours. Do not confuse it with the determiner your, as in your efforts much appreciated. In this example, your is modifying effort. It's not replacing any words. And again, that's what pronouns do. Pronouns replace nouns. This is yours. There are reflexive pronouns as well, yourself and yourselves. You'll have to do it yourself. You all take such good care of yourselves. As we start to wrap things up, I do want to make a note about formal writing. Traditionally, writers only use the third person in formal writing. And when I'm talking about formal writing, I'm talking about academic essays. So if I was writing a high school essay right now and I was to say, I think reading Shakespeare has value, chances are the English teacher is going to put an X beside it. But if I change it to 
one thinks reading Shakespeare has value, all of a sudden it's correct. This is controversial. I personally think it's fine for high school students to be using first person in a formal essay. I get into a lot of arguments with other English teachers over this because it's no, no, no. Essays must be objective. When you start to use the first person, you're bringing yourself into the argument and you're no longer being objective. Using the third person gives the writer distance between themselves and the topic being discussed. To which I say, but it's the student who's writing the essay. Why do we need to make it more difficult by making them stick to the third person? One common re uh, reply is, well, journal articles are all written in the third person. And I say 99% of my students are never going to write a journal article. I just want them to enjoy the writing process. And I think by making them stick to the third person, it creates an artificial barrier and it makes writing not as fun. So I say, yes, if you're going to train yourself to write journal articles, then you better be used to the third person. Otherwise, I personally am fine with writing in the first person. I will tell you this, we use you a lot, I just mentioned it, we use it to make generalizations. Don't use that in formal writing because that is a lot different. To me, when I'm reading an essay and it says, I think reading Shakespeare has value, and I'm reading another essay that says one thinks reading Shakespeare has value, okay, I come to the third essay. You think reading Shakespeare has value. Well, I do, but it's really speaking loudly to me in that formal writing. It really seems to be telling me what I think and what I want, and it just sounds bad. So I will make a blanket statement, never use second person in formal writing. Stick to third person, and if you're wondering, well, is it okay if I use first person here? Check with your teacher, check with your instructor, and just be on the safe side. Finally, we have interrogative pronouns. Oh, one of my favorite words, interrogative. It means questioning, to interrogate. Likewise, these pronouns have to do with traditional question words. What? So there's a noun I need to know about. Uh, what school do you go to? as opposed to presenting a choice. Oh, well, which school do you go to? Do you go to school A or school B? Who? I'm asking about a person. When I'm asking whom, I'm asking about an object. And when I ask whose, I'm looking for the owner. Interrogative pronouns help to ask clarifying questions about subjects and objects. Let's take a look at some examples. What is her name? Which game would you like to play? Who should he listen to? Straightforward enough. Now, it takes an English teacher to know the difference between whom and who. Whom refers to an object. It's helpful to say to whom should he speak to. Because by saying to whom, it's going to help you and your ear think, yeah, that is the right word to use. I am referring to an object, uh, well, a person as an object, so I better use whom. But in all honesty, whom is rarely used. I would say that it's mostly used by English teachers. So if you're an English teacher, fantastic, go with it. But when it comes to everyday speech, if you were to say, who should he talk to? Chances are no one's going to correct you uh, about that. Uh, moving on, whose refers to an inanimate object. So I've got this phone here. I don't know who it belongs to. Whose is that phone? Whose, W-H-O-S-E, sounds exactly like W-H-O apostrophe S, which is a contraction for who is. Who is going to the party? So when you're writing, if you're asking who is the owner of something, use whose. If you want to know who is, whose, who apostrophe s. 
there is something called compound interrogative pronouns, where we add the suffix ever. We do this to add emphasis. What will we do? As opposed to whatever will we do? Now, you're not going to see this emphasis used that often because it can go the wrong way. Uh, as you're going to see in a moment, creating the emphasis almost is an attempt at uh, humor. You know, what are we going to do? What will we do? As opposed to whatever will we do? It just sounds overly formal and people don't use it that often. Not that you can't use it. I'm just giving you a warning that be aware of the emphasis that you're actually adding to your writing. We don't always use interrogative pronouns to ask questions. We can use them to make statements, such as, <clears throat> we need to figure out who to ask and what to do. That's not a question, that's a plan of action. And also, if you're quite frustrated with what's going on around you, you might use the emphasis, whatever, whatever, with an exclamation mark, just sort of say, to express your general frustration with the situation. That's a good use of that emphasis. So we don't use a question mark when we're making a statement. We use question marks when we're making questions. So now let's wrap this up. We covered a lot of ground in this presentation on pronouns. Pronouns replace nouns. First, second person pronouns are gender neutral, whereas third person pronouns have gender, which is why some people have preferred pronouns. And if you're aware of them, use them. And if you're not sure, you can always get away with using the plural form of the pronoun. When you're using the first person personal pronoun, remember, it's always a capital I, never a small I. We're going to use third person in formal writing. And reflexive pronouns help when the subject doubles as the object. And finally, interrogative pronouns are used for questions and statements. Adverbs, simply put, are words that modify verbs. They add descriptions onto action words. As we're going to see, they can also modify other adverbs as well as adjectives. They often end in ly, but not always, particularly when adverbs act like adjectives and they can appear in different positions in the sentence. So let's see what we can get out of this lesson. I've put a few sentences up here and beside the type of word that's being modified, and I have not said it so far in this video, but as a reminder, this sort of stuff is for English teachers. Those who need to know the proper terms for the different words in a sentence and how they're operating. If you're just someone trying to get better with your writing, this is still going to help you out. But don't be too concerned about the technical terms, such as the first sentence. He closed the door quietly. In this sentence, closed is the verb and it's being modified with the adverb quietly. What's going on with the door? Well, it's being shut quietly. An example of how an adverb can modify another adverb is the phrase too quietly. How can an adverb modify an adjective? Very quiet. And I have a lot to say about the word very uh, in a moment. As we've seen in other videos, an adverb can actually modify an entire clause. In this case here, I'm just going to say sentence. Unfortunately, I did not hear him leave. So in this sense here, unfortunately is the adverb, and it's modifying the whole sentence. As a general warning, limit the use of adverbs to avoid wordiness. Use very very rarely. Uh, if I had to think of a stereotypical bad composition from a student, maybe they had to 
describe themselves in a hundred words. And they use the word very at least 10 times in the hope that, oh, if I keep on using words, I'm eventually going to get to that word count without realizing that good writing is tight writing. We want to eliminate unnecessary words. And quite often, the word very is very unnecessary. This is also a chance to think about, well, what is it? That you're describing was it that you want to say if you're talking about a uh, as i've mentioned before in other videos if you're talking about a big house a large house you want to say mansion and in this case here instead of saying very big or very large want to just say huge or massive but if it's like well it's like huge times massive well then how about the word gargantuan as i keep stressing the more you read and the more you try writing, the more you'll expand your vocabulary and you'll find other ways to describe phenomenon or whatever it is that you're looking at in as few words as possible. So with that said, let's move on. When you are going to use an adverb, it's because you have something to add about how something is happening. Is it happening fast or slowly, softly or loudly, now or later, here or there? When you have vital information you want to share with your audience, as in you have a vital descriptive word for what's happening, it's really crucial to really getting the gist of what's happening right now, well then use that adverb. But if you don't need to use it, just skip it. Keep your writing as simply as possible. As simple as possible. A quick note while we're going along here about adverbs and linking verbs. We did a video on linking verbs. Oh, we have a video on verbs galore. Go check it out. So we look at, we've looked at sentences that have a subject, linking verb, and then a modifier, such as an adjective. Uh, the car goes fast. In this case here, though, again, most adverbs in their regular form end in L-Y. If you are using a linking verb, the adverb is going to look more like an adjective. There is the word greatly in English, such as, uh, oh, now I'm on a spot, uh, this concerns us greatly. That's the sentence I was trying to think of. But if you were to say, he sings greatly, uh, English speakers, native speakers in the audience are just going to know, yeah, that just sounds wrong. And it's like, but greatly is the adverb, and it's describing the way that he sings. When you are using a linking verb, write the adverb as it would appear as an adjective. So the proper way to say it would be, he sings great. And English listeners in the audience are going to be nodding, saying, yeah, that does sound a lot better. But of course, on this channel, we never say, well, it just sounds better. Go with it. We always have to explain it. In this case here, an adverb is sometimes written like it would as an adjective because you're using a linking verb. I said we would explain it. I'm not saying the explanations would be nice and neat or that we would like them, but there it is. Why don't we move on? Comparatives and superlatives. I always have fun saying that word. I always say it different each time. Uh, we're going to, on occasion, fine-tune those adverbs with the qualifiers uh, more or most. Who is more likely to use social media? He greeted the crowd most warmly. As you can probably tell already, adverbs can be annoying to begin with, and when we're starting to add comparatives and superlatives uh, to them, again, it's not that it never happens and that you shouldn't do it, but like I said, this is the value of editing. If you write something down and you're not sure it sounds very good, or it sounds good at all, just move on. You can always go back and edit it. Now, when it comes to placement of the adverb, there's no good news. Adverbs can appear potentially anywhere in the sentence. More often than not, they're close to the word that they're modifying. 
Uh, so not only do you have to worry about that, but you also have to think that the placement of the adverb within the sentence can dramatically change the meaning of that sentence. Let's check this out. It's entirely difficult to follow his instructions. It's difficult to entirely follow his instructions. It's difficult to follow his instructions entirely. So what is difficult? Are you saying that following instructions in general, uh, you know, to a T, step by step, is that what's being, is that what's difficult? Or is there something about the instructions themselves that you're having trouble following each and every step? Uh, and again, don't, what is it that you want to do? When you're thinking about your writing, when you're thinking about what you want to say, what is it that you want to say? Who is doing what to whom? What precisely is it that you want to say? And again, you're going to try to get that down on paper. And if you're thinking, I know I can write that better, great. Maybe you can do that later because... It, when you're getting your ideas on the on the page, it's very bad to get bogged down in a single sentence. The point here is that say what it is that you want to say. And if you need adverbs to say it, fantastic. And if you're not sure you're saying it correctly, that's okay. You can come back to it later. So for the recap, and I knew getting into a video on adverbs that it's kind of difficult to make a nice package with them. What I would like you to walk away with is the idea that to use adverbs sparingly. Yes, sometimes they can be fantastic for properly framing the action, communicating an idea for exactly how something is happening, but they can become annoying very quickly. And see, now, now I can't stop saying very because I've got it in my head. So say it is that you want to say, if you have an adverb, think carefully about its placement in the sentence and how moving it around can change the meaning of that sentence. And by all means, if you can think of a better word to replace the adverb, uh, go for it. Adjectives. They modify nouns. And when we say modify nouns, all that really means is we're adding descriptive words to our text and we are adding on some quality and quantity factors to our noun. In English, the adjective usually appears immediately before the noun, as in the sentence, the big house or the huge house. In this case, big modifies the noun house. And we can go on and on with this. That was an amazing play. What a huge effort. Identify the noun. If you want to add on some descriptive uh, words to that noun, that's where your adjectives come in. And we can use multiple adjectives for the same noun, such as the sentence, the snake revealed two massive white fangs. Now, Sometimes the adjectives will require commas or a conjunction such as end. I put together a sentence here. I need a nice long vacation somewhere hot but quiet. Now, you may be wondering how come in the snake sentence you piled the adjectives on, whereas in the second sentence, you used uh, a comma for one set of the adjectives, nice and long, whereas you used uh, a conjunction but in between hot and quiet. So when do you use the commas and when do you use the conjunctions and when do you just skip them? On this channel, we don't say just because. We don't say, oh, because it sounds good. There is an answer for everything. And when it comes into proper use of commas, we often get into a detailed conversation about clauses. So I'm going to uh, kind of take the easy way out on this one and not explain how come I've got commas and conjunctions in the second example and not in the first one. All I can say for now, it has to do with clauses.
and I'm going to leave it at that. But the more videos you watch on this channel, and the more you personally read and write, the more obvious it's going to become when you need to make those grammatical calls or punctuation calls. What I will do right now is give you a warning that because the writer can pile on adjectives, I hope it's obvious that that can become annoying. It can just become, uh, it can really ruin a, a good piece of writing to add in unnecessary adjectives where you're just piling on the description and making it thicker and thicker so that the reader just doesn't want to make the effort to cut their way through it. Always keep your writing tight and interesting. And you'll be saying, well, how do I do that? Well, the how is in the, the writer's craft. I can just tell you, describe what is necessary and move on. If you think there's a good word to add on to your noun, a good adjective, a good descriptive word, well, go for it. Add it in there. See how it sounds. And of course, we're always going to have the courage to edit. And we're always going to favor substance over description. And as a side note, this is also a good example of where you need to develop your vocabulary. Because instead of saying uh, a big house or the huge house, why not just say mansion? Always use one word instead of two. And if you're thinking, you know what, in this case, huge house is the perfect way to describe it, great. Go with it and move on. And why don't we move on in the meantime? And as we move along here, I should point out that although in English, the adjective will usually come right before the noun, immediately before the noun, it can appear elsewhere, 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 yeah, elsewhere in the sentence thanks to something called a predicate adjective. Here we go, English teachers, uh, terminology time. You're going to use a linking verb, such as the verb to be, to use an adjective to modify the subject. As in the sentence, that car is fast. Car is the noun here, but it's also the subject. The car is fast. So is is our linking verb, taking that adjective fast and taking us back to car thanks to something called a subjective complement. And to me, this is another one of the examples of the magic of language. Even though the adjective doesn't appear until the end of the sentence, even though in English we read from left to right, when we get to that adjective at the end, its meaning reverberates, meaning back through the sentence. And anyways, all, all you need to take away from there is an adjective can appear elsewhere in the sentence to modify the subject. The actual terms for it, you don't need to know about it. You don't need to remember it. Okay, now that we're getting more confident with adjectives, you can know that there's three different types. Again, English teacher type territory. There's absolute, comparative, and superlative adjectives. I always like saying that word, superlative. Our absolute adjectives are our basic adjectives, basic describing words. Good luck, sneaky guy, strict rules, angry birds, terrible news. Now, when we talk about comparative adjectives, Obviously, there's a comparison going on. We're taking that noun and comparing it to itself or a similar group, another noun. So if one set of guys is sneaky, but there's another group that is more sneaky, we would say sneakier guys, stricter rules angrier birds. We're going to follow normal spelling conventions in English. If English has normal spelling conventions, quite often we can just add ER onto the adjective such as stricter. But 
If the word ends in a Y, the Y becomes an I, such as sneakier and angrier. Uh, for those who are familiar with the English language, you'll know that we don't have a word gooder. That through the evolution of the English language, if we want to say something is more good than something else, we say that it is better. And on that note, if an adjective has more than one syllable, chances are we can't just add er to it, such as terrible. We don't say in English te te terrible -er. Uh, we, we just don't do it. It's a multi-syllable word, so we're actually just going to use the word more for our comparative adjective. You got terrible news? Well, I have more terrible news, like it's a contest or something. Finally, we have the superlative adjectives. So if something is the best or the greatest, we need to make sure that it stands out. And just like the comparative adjectives, we're going to add ER. For the superlatives, we're just going to add EST, such as the strictest rules or the sneakiest guys. They, they, are, the, they are the most sneakiest out of everyone in the group. They are the sneakiest guys. They are the angriest birds. That two-syllable rule uh, continues to apply. We can't say terribleist in English. The word just doesn't exist. We say most terrible. Oh, we had terrible news, and we had more terrible news, and now we have the most terrible news. But on the bright side, I wish you the best of luck. We don't have goodist in English. It's, uh, well, perhaps it's a slang term. Instead, we say best. So, I feel this is pretty straightforward, and let's just move along to what I think is really cool, and that is adjectives have a hierarchy. They have an order of preference. Even though we can use multiple adjectives to describe the same noun, we need to think about what is it about that quality and quantity that we're using to modify the noun. It comes in the order of opinion, size, age, color, origin, material, purpose. If you're familiar with the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, you may have noticed that you cannot rearrange those adjectives. You cannot say, my Greek fat big wedding. You can't say, my fat big Greek wedding. Uh, English natives in the audience will say, yeah, that doesn't sound right. Why is that? That's part of the magic of English. That adjectives, the way they modify the noun. As you modify that noun and it develops, you'll find that the adjectives must come in a certain order or it just becomes gibberish. And if you don't believe me, take any inanimate object, any noun that's in front of you right now. Look at that object and then think, okay, in another world, if I was to have that same object, what is its purpose? What is it, what is it made out of? Where did it come from? What color is it? How old is it? How big is it? And what is your general opinion of it? Is it something that is good, something that is bad? Look at that object, give it all those adjectives, and then just try to put together a sentence where you don't follow the order of opinion, size, age, color, origin, material, purpose, and you'll find that, yeah, it just doesn't sound right. And if you're new to English and you're not sure what sounds right, just trust me on this one. Write down this order. Keep it in your notes because if you're going to be using multiple adjectives, you're going to want to have this list in front of you. So to recap, adjectives describe nouns. They usually appear right before the noun, but they can appear later in the sentence to modify the subject. You can use more than one adjective, but again, you're only using the adjective because you have the perfect descriptive word for that noun. And if you're thinking, well, I don't know if I really need to modify the noun, then don't. 
keep your writing tight. And then while you're at it, if you're keeping score at home, you're an English teacher, there are three different kinds of adjectives, absolute, comparative, and superlative. Grammatical articles are what we use when we are indicating to our audience if we're referring to something specific or unspecific, if we're referring to something in general or something we really want to zero in on. For example, get in the car. There's only one car that I'm referring to. As opposed to, look at the cars. Uh, I'm not really pointing to anyone in particular. I'm just gesturing to say to a car park or parking lot. As opposed to saying, I need a car. So maybe you're at the, you're, you're renting a car and you're, you're really, you're not that picky. Just, I need a car. So we use these constantly in English. They're practically in, uh, it feels like just about every sentence that we, that we say. So it's really important that we get a grip on which article to use in the, any given context. So let's take a closer look. The definite article, the, T-H-E, focuses attention on a particular person, people, place, places, things, or things. Uh, the reason for the, the slash is there, it's because this works with singular and for plural. If I'm referring to one specific president, I mean, the president or the presidents, let's go to the park or on trips we like visiting the parks, the toy, the toys. So very straightforward, just you're drawing the, uh, the audience's attention to a particular thing. So it goes before the noun. On the other hand, we quite often refer to things that are not that specific. Uh, if you're talking to someone, so does your country have a president or a prime minister? Uh, would you like to go to a park? So in no park in particular, just let's just get outside. And uh, you know, the baby's upset. Can you please pass him a toy? So it doesn't matter which toy. Well, it's whatever toy is going to get the baby to uh, be happier, right? <laughs> now, the reason why I have two words here, A slash N, A, N, these are not two different words. This is the same word word. The reason why it has two different spellings is actually to help us pronounce it better if the noun begins with a vowel sound. This probably is quite confusing for those who don't understand what makes a vowel a vowel. Qu quickly put, it's an uninterrupted sound. So if you have the uninterrupted a uh, followed by another uninterrupted sound, when can you take a breath? Try saying a apple quickly. Apple. Try saying a onion quickly. Onion. It just you, you need something in between the a and the actual word so it doesn't sound like gibberish. So we simply just put in a, a consonant sound there with the n, an apple, an onion. So the simplest way. Uh, the, the, the dirty rule here is if the noun begins with a vowel, put an, but that isn't going to fix it 100% of the time because if you look at the word union, union, even though it begins with a vowel, doesn't make a strong enough vowel sound that we need it in there. So we say a union as opposed to an union. Just native speakers will hear that sounds odd right away. And... If you look at a word like honor, the H, it's, it's not completely silent, but in this case, yeah, we really don't need an H in there to spell the, or to, <laughs> to get the, the, the sounds we need for honor. So we can't say a honor, we say an honor. So if the noun begins with a vowel sound, go with an, otherwise you're just going to put a, a president, a park, a toy. And quick note, because A also means one in English, can you please pass me a pen? The indefinite article is always going to be singular. 
through the magic of the English language, when the noun becomes plural, it can no longer be unspecific. It just becomes specific. So you can never say, please pass me A apples, because I mean, that's just obviously gibberish. If A means one, please pass me the apples. Moving along, quick point. We have also looked at adjectives on this channel. Adjectives give an extra description a word to the noun. It's a word that comes before the noun that gives it some extra details. So since the article also has to come before the noun, in this case, it's very easy. The article always comes before the adjective, which comes before the noun. A fresh apple. So A, there's your article, fresh your adjective, and your noun is apple. And now notice, I didn't need to say an there because a and we get the consonant sound fresh at, with the next word and so again the only reason why we ever spell it an is just to help us pronounce it better such as an honorable finish and when it comes to the definite article the new phone the former presidents very straightforward now let's get into something a little bit more challenging Articles and non-count nouns. Uh, please watch our video, Nouns Galore, for a deep dive into all the, uh, the wonderful world of nouns. Sometimes things can't be reasonably counted. Let's just say you're at the beach and you're looking at the sand and you're looking out across the water. I mean, there's only one body of water there. There's only one large collection of sand. But when you actually pick up sand in your hand, you can't say a sand or the sand. You have sand in your hand. It usually works well with a determiner, such as the word some. Like, I have some sand in my shoe. So... There's really no uh, a quick rule here because I've already demonstrated that you can have the article in front of a non-count noun, such as the sand is hot on bare feet. You could have a determiner in front of it. That helps to narrow it in. And sometimes it's inappropriate to even have an article altogether, such as you're getting sand everywhere. So I really don't have a good cheat code for you on this one. This is just something that's going to come with practice, but I can give you a little bit of advice. So reflect, am I referring to something specific? This gets into the area of what uh, Michelle Thomas, uh, yeah, great language tapes, uh, please listen to him. He talks about a heightened awareness of language. So when you're really zeroing in on this person, place, or thing that you're looking at, how specific is it? If it's specific, it's going to take on the definite article, such as the happiness of my family is important. I mean, how do you measure happiness? How do you count it? But if I'm really thinking about what's important to my family and I'm isolating that concept, I put the article in front of it as opposed to a general sense of that abstract idea containing with happiness. Let's hope the donation brings some happiness, as opposed to let's hope the donation brings happiness. If you listen carefully there, you're putting a lot of expectation on that donation, that it's going to solve everything, and it's going to sweep into this whole thing that we call happiness. So you're, you're qualifying it, you're limiting it a little bit, but just by saying some happiness, as opposed to just referring to the concept in general, happiness is important. So my advice here is, you're thinking in, how specific am I being? Most of the time, putting the article is not going to work with an abstract idea. The determiner usually works better. And looking over these examples, happiness is important. I could also say some happiness is important. 
and I more or less keep the same idea. Don't be too scared of making mistakes when you're learning a language because this is a really good example of where we learn from our mistakes. You, you take a risk, you get it out there, and you maybe even begin to hear it. That, no, that doesn't sound right. I should think about that. Or maybe you get corrected. At the end of the day, it's a good example of where you learn something from the error, and chances are you're not going to cause a major embarrassment for yourself or others by forgetting or misunderstanding an article in front of a noun. But if you can think of ways, of funny ways uh, you could mess that up, well, hey, please put it down in the comments. I would love to read them. And to tell you the truth, it, there's other things that don't really seem to make much sense. I've long noticed that when it comes to television, people tend not to say, I'm going to watch the television or I'm going to watch a television. You know, let's watch television. And I'm also seeing it more with very popular social media uh, platforms such as Instagram or TikTok. He's on TikTok. What does that even mean? I mean, is he scrolling through it? Like he's actively viewing it? Is he posting content onto TikTok? It really doesn't make that much sense. If you have no idea what TikTok is, it's like, oh, well, if you don't know what TikTok is, of course it's going to be gibberish. And even to say he's on the TikTok or he's on a TikTok, I mean, actually, the second one could refer to a particular TikTok video, but to say he's on the TikTok, instantly makes you sound like you're 90 years old. So I'm not sure what's going on with these tangible things. You can see a television, you can see TikTok. So it's not that abstract, but why don't they take on an article? I'm really not sure. If you have any theories of your own, please put it down in the comments. I'd love to hear it. But in the meantime, uh, I don't have a clear rule for you when it comes to these uh, mass media platform, platforms and why they're not taking on an article. The good news is we have a good roadmap to success here that's going to work over 90% of the time. So to recap, if you have an unspecified singular noun, use a, unless that noun begins with a vowel sound, then add in an N. It's the same word, but it's going to help you pronounce that noun. And if it's, if it's specified or a plural noun, always use the. When you're getting into non-count nouns, you just need to think about the context of the sentence and what you're specifically referring to. Think of a determiner, such as some, a lot, many, words like that to help narrow in what you are referring to when you're looking at something that can't be technically counted. Some nouns, mostly abstract, or as we saw with these uh, mass media platforms, take no article, and they just need to be learned over time. The more you practice, the more you interact with the language, you're going to be great. Conjunctions are joining words. They help us organize ideas within and between sentences, and in doing so, they help us smooth out ideas. Again, these are words we use all the time, but they pack a lot of meaning in them. To start us off, here are seven examples of conjunctions. Words like end, that's used to add information, but contrasts an idea. So, sets up a result. Or, sets up a choice. Nor, there's something not happening in the sentence, yet a concession, and because there is some kind of reason. This is not an exhaustive list of conjunctions, but these are the seven you're most likely using most often. So let's take a moment to read these out. I go to school and I work. I want to go to the store, but I forgot my wallet. I was late for class, so I got a detention. Do you want coffee or tea? Moving on, I don't want to hear excuses nor listen to complaints. I'm exhausted, yet I'm not giving up. I took a pill because I have a headache. These are simple ideas 
that are being expressed with the aid of conjunctions. We use them so often, and we don't give them a whole lot of thought, but then when you take a moment to really think about how they help convey meaning, for example, if we go back to one of the earlier sentences, I go to school and I work. So, simple statement could be expressed as two separate sentences because I'm doing two different things. However, if I was to say, I go to school, but I work, that could set up a whole other unexpressed idea about the challenges of trying to do both just by changing the conjunction. In the second sentence, uh, perhaps you want to be funny. I want to go to the store and I forgot my wallet. Really doesn't get the idea across other than the verbal irony is set up by switching up the conjunction. And we could go through each one of these examples and change out the conjunction to change the idea being expressed, but i like you to try that on your own, either by, if you're learning the language and you're trying to fine-tune your ideas, pay attention to the conjunctions that you're using. If you're further along your journey and you are an inspiring writer, next time you go to write, take a moment at and take a look at the conjunctions that you're using and think about how, by switching up the conjunctions, you may very well switch up an idea you're trying to convey to the reader. In the meantime, the recap. Conjunctions combine ideas to smooth out more complex sentences. Prepositions. And when we're talking about prepositions, it's important to remember that it's all relative. Let's get into it. So, all parts of speech are important because they're all building blocks to building meaning. Prepositions' role in it all is to indicate where something is in relation to something else. It's the simplest way uh, one can put it. We also use it for uh, telling time, and they can often be overlooked for their importance because quite often they just have two letters, but those two letters can pack a lot of meaning, as we're going to see. First of all, if you're to give or to understand instructions, you must understand prepositions. Words that you're going to see a lot, to, from, towards, through. So, uh, this recording is being done in Barrie, Ontario, which is north of Toronto. So, you know, if you're coming from Toronto to Barrie, notice how the prepositions are allowing us to use geographical places in the real world as placeholders and explaining something in their relation to one another to get meaning through to the audience, through relationships. Go through the woods and towards the village. These are all key words in giving directions, and they're all prepositions. Whenever you are looking at the time or providing the time to someone else, you are using prepositions. You're using words like in, at, on, since, from, to, until, by, as in these sentences, in the spring, at one o'clock. Since 1 o'clock, from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, we are open until 8, be here by 5 o'clock. Pardon the childish picture here, but drawing a diagram is a great way to understand how we use prepositions in location and space. So really, prepositions are all about time and space. Think about any object you can use as an anchor, such as a house, or even a, let's see, take an example of a boat. If you picture boat on the water, there can be fish under the boat, there can be birds above the boat, there could be another boat beside the boat. We also use a lot of prepositional phrases in English, and Simply put, it's when we combine a verb with a preposition. I'll pay with my credit card. I'll buy for all of us. So whenever you see a verb immediately followed by a preposition, pay attention to that. And if you're an English language learner, 
make a note of it because we use prepositional phrases a lot in everyday speech. Now, in passing, as I want to mention, you may have heard the rule, you cannot end a sentence with a preposition. If you haven't heard it, good, because it's rubbish. It's not true at all. Of course, you can end a sentence with a preposition. We use it all, we say it all the time. When will she be in? Some will hear that and say, no, that's not proper English because, well, what? How are you going to rephrase that so that it actually sounds better or gets more the meaning across? So as you've seen in this presentation, prepositions can begin a sentence with whom are you going, and they can be in the middle of a sentence. Your hat is on the table. So prepositions go where they need to go because, again, they are describing the relationship of most likely the subject of the sentence to objects within the sentence. Now, I, I do need to give the warning that informal speech tends to overuse prepositions. So as, as in the sentence, where are you at? Where are you at? The question ends with where are you? At doesn't add anything to the sentence. It's uh, superfluous information. So that can just be edited out. So this is more in regards to formal writing. You got to remember good writing is tight writing. Tight writing is good writing. Don't use two words when one words will do. I give all these all sorts of rules in these uh, presentations. Really when it comes down to it, in informal speech, don't worry about prepositions at all. Your meaning is going to get across. In formal writing, though, again, be aware that sometimes we'll add in a preposition that's just not needed because the words you've already used get the meaning across. So to recap, prepositions are all about time and space. To give and understand directions, awareness of prepositions is mandatory. This is why it's a part of speech. Be aware of the use of uh, prepositions in regards to combinations such as the uh, phrases that we, we just looked at. And just make a note of where that preposition is appearing in the sentence if you're developing your writing skills or your English language skills because there's lots of good information to learn just in everyday conversations. And when it comes to formal writing, be careful not to overuse prepositions. If you don't need to use it, just don't use it. What do I need to know about clauses? First of all, what is this? It's a technical term, and unless you're actually teaching English or really trying to understand the ins and outs of the language, this is really not a video you're going to need. But if you find yourself teaching English or you just simply want to know more about what clauses are, well, you're in the right spot. A clause, simply put, is a subject and a finite verb. Clauses form the foundations for compound and complex sentences. So obviously we need to explain what that's all about. This will be some review, but what is a subject? A subject in a sentence is the point that's being made. It can be implicit or explicit, as in explicit. It's it's right there on the page. You can point to the dog's house. Okay, what's the subject? The subject is the dog. It's right there. Implicit means that you have to do a little bit of thinking about exactly what the subject is. Uh, if, for example, if I was to give you the command, clean this up. You are actually the subject of the sentence. You are the one who's going to be doing the cleaning up, even though there was no actual reference to you in the sentence. So it's getting a little bit more in depth than I wanted to get into, but the subject is going to have a noun, person, place, or thing, or possibly a pronoun, which is a word that replaces a noun. Coming up next. There is the predicate. What's the subject doing? Whereas the subject can be implicit or explicit, the predicate 
is going to be explicit. It's going to be clear what is happening to or with the subject. In this case, we're talking specifically about finite verbs. A finite verb is a fancy way of saying a regular old verb. It's not playing any tricks. It's not acting like it's a noun. The verb is being a verb. For example, uh, the, the verb to play. He plays, is playing, he played. These are all examples of the finite verb. So let's take a look at this in action. The excited gamer squeezed around the computer screen. So where is the subject? The excited gamers. That is who this idea is about. And what are the gamers doing? What's happening with them? They're squeezed around the computer screen. So highlighted in red, you've got the subject. Highlighted in blue, we've got the predicate. And so bring it all together and we have a clause. It's that simple. Now, technically, this is an independent clause, so I'll squeeze that in there. Because, yes, there are different kinds of clauses. But to recap, there are different kinds of clauses. Simply put, a clause is a subject and a predicate. Why do we want clauses? They allow for the creation of complex and compound sentences. And as I said right up front, that unless you're actually teaching this, it's not that important to know if you are a writer and you want your writer writing to get better. If your sentences are communicating clear ideas, don't worry too much about identifying the clause.